Hi, Rufilo, how are you? Hi, I do. I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so, Rufilo, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Rufilo? Where did you grow up? Um, and the school you went to? Yeah, um, so I'm Rufilo Ramudibe, and I actually grew up in a town, um, small town um, called Bakersdown, just in the west of of Johannesburg. Um, it's a mining township. So I actually started school there and I later on moved to um, a school in the in the town, um, which is called Western Area. And I completed my high school in Krugersdorp um, at a school called Townview High School. Awesome. So during your schooling period, did you know what you wanted to do after work or how did you know where to go in terms of varsity? Yeah, so I thought I knew what I wanted to do, right? So um, as a child growing up, I've always been like interested in working with people and I just had an interest in helping in, in the helping field. So as a child, I wanted to become a social worker because that's all we knew uh, growing up. And as I grew older, I went to high school and I was very like passionate about the sciences. So I thought I wanted to become a doctor at some point. Um, a whole lot of confusion. Um, and I think when I was in grade nine in particular, that's when I discovered um, psychology and I wanted to become a clinical psychologist. So when I went to varsity, uh, because I was so good at math and science, um, and you know with black parents, they kind of like try and, and channel you towards studying certain things. So my mom being a school teacher, she was like, you're very good in science, you're very good with, you know, in, in biology, so don't study psychology, because psychology, I thought I should, you know, I wanted to do a BA degree. And she was like, no, you're going to do a BAC degree um, just to open up your options. And that's what I enrolled to study. So, yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's how I chose my, kind of like chose my, my degree when I got to varsity. But the nice thing about the BSc degree was that it allowed me to take psychology as an extra course. So I never, I didn't lose out um, technically. So I took the science subject and then I took psychology as an extra course. Awesome. So yes. I'm assuming uh, you were studying for three to four years somewhere there and which yes. varsity did you choose? So I went to Vets University. Um, it has just been recently voted as the best university in Africa. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, so I'm a Betsy, I'm a total Betsy. Um, I went and I studied there and yeah, so I, I actually studied, I started with a BSc degree, like I was saying now, now. So did a whole, you know, uh, range of subjects, science, biology and so forth with my psychology, of course. And when I completed my degree, I got a scholarship actually to go and study um, towards um, honors degree in paleontology. Sure. But I was so torn. I got, yeah, third year. You know, a part of me wants to do psychology, and I ended up actually changing from clinical psychology into industrial psychology. And that clicked when I got to second year because, you know, you never know about these things in industry. So I didn't know anything about industrial psychology. The only psychology I really knew about was clinical psychology. So when I got to second year, they introduced subjects um, towards industrial psychology. And I was like, oh, this actually is more interesting than clinical. And I started having this passion towards it. Um, and then that's when I when I got to third year, then I selected industrial psychology courses completely. But I was also still doing a BSc. So there's diversion. My career could have turned either way. Get a scholarship from Professor Berger. Uh, to study paleontology, and at the same time, I got accepted in industrial psychology honors. So I had to choose which one I wanted. And I guess for me, what helped me in terms of decision was going back to my first love, which is working with people. Paleontology is science. I felt, you know, working in a lab was not something that I was really passionate about. So my love for working with people made me select the, the the honest route towards industrial psychology and I ended up actually um, pursuing that. So honors degree went straight into my master's um, immediately after that and I completed my master's in yeah so I was in varsity for a good five years 
Um, yeah, so it wasn't, it was quite a long journey. So I left with my master's because I really wanted to, to, um, to pursue the industrial psychology field. And I thought I want to be reg a registered, you know, psychologist. So I needed to complete my master's so I can do my internship and, um, and get registered. Okay. So I want, I want us to take one step back in terms of yeah. your funding, because I mean, I heard you talk about a scholarship. So who funded your undergrad and your five-year period within uh, your psychology qualification? Sure. So <laughs> the funding for undergrad is a bit of a roller coaster one, right? Okay. First year, my mom working for the government, I couldn't qualify for financial aid. So, you know, the, that whole concept of the missing middle. Yeah. I experienced that because my mom could not afford to take me to varsity. But at the same time, because she worked for the government, um, you know, she could not she could not qualify or I could not qualify for financial aid when I was in first year. So first year, you know, this is where, you know, th that whole concept of black tax for me, I, I'm, I'm very sensitive around that because I was fortunate enough to have certain people in my family who really assisted me when I was in first year. So my uncle happened to be, you know, he, he was pro-education and um, him and my grandmother and my mom, uh, my late grandmother, the three of them, they put their heads together to just make sure that I had um, registration fees. I had money, you know, for, for, for the flat that I used to stay at because I used to stay at a flat um, and then money for books and so forth. So I had, you know, help from, from my uncle and my grandmother. They helped my mom. Um, so it was self-funded basically first year. Second year, 75% of it was self-funded. I tried my luck again with the financial aid and I applied. And I happened to just get 25% um, of the fees paid. So it was 75% self-funded, 25% um, financial aid. And when I got to third year, it was also self-funded again. Sure. So I, the entire, my undergrad was a bit of a, yeah, it was self-funded, but I was fortunate enough to, I think it was around about September when um, my mom had paid majority of the fees. And I just got a letter from Vitz um, saying that I qualified for some scholarship that I never even applied for, right? Sure. And apparently what had happened was that Coke, um, Coca-Cola had selected um, top 30 students in BSc or something like that. I can't remember the details. And they offered to, to pay um, our fees and res and all of that. So I, my mom actually got her money back in third year. So it started out as a self-funding, but then they paid us the money, even though we, we had already paid some um, a portion of the, the fees. So I was fortunate enough to actually get that um, that scholarship, which I never even applied for. And and then postgrad, it was funded by the university. So the nice thing about postgrad, it's yeah. So they if you get you qualify by getting sixty five percent and above, and by virtue of you getting like seventy percent, then you qualify for the scholarship at um, at university. So I never paid my fees for my honors and my masters. It was paid by vids. Okay, so we take a number of things from there. Clearly, you're a very smart kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another interesting thing for me is, um, I believe industrial psychology masters. It's not that mm -hmm. you get in. I mean, I find a lot of people are saying, "I've got my honours. I do want to qualify as an industrial yeah. psychologist and registered." but I can't get into a master's program because it's that hard. Tell us a yeah. little bit about that. So how many students make it into the master's and, and what, what's, what is the master's like? Phew, so I'm going to shock you. So when we were in um, honors, there was 15 of us, right? Um, and out of the 15 students, four of them were part-time students. So it was like literally just 11 uh, full-timers. And we got to our masters we were about eight sure and about two uh part-timers so um so getting into masters i, I think let me just go back to to postgrad industrial psychology and the difference between undergrad and postgrad so the way that postgrad is structured it's it's structured in such a way that you 
you know, you are challenged to start actually, um, it's, it's not like entirely theoretical. So I think that's where now you, you are given the theory, but you are given the challenge to actually start applying that theory. Um, and the conversations that take place there, I must, I must admit the jump between third year and honors was something else. Hey, like, I think for me, I got a shock of my life. Like, what have I been doing over the last three years? Because it was so intense. Honors is intense. The amount of work is a lot. Um, there's a lot of dedication that you are, that, that, you, that is required from you. Um, a lot of sacrifice from a time perspective. But also you are challenged mentally to apply yourself outside of what, what you are given from a theory perspective. When you get to master's, totally also another stretch. Um, you we was we started being given like you know challenges that were industry specific. I remember one of the one of the exercises that we got was we had to actually go to the airports company um, and go and study how the whole industry from an airport company was structured. So now you are the student who's used to like a textbook um, and you are given an assignment to actually go and do something that is work related. And that's where now the challenge comes in. And I think when they select individuals, the, the process that they go through, because they, we, we actually went through an interview process like you are applying for a job. Sure. In a matter of you got the marks and then you were automatically into masters. So how it, it structured was that you needed to to actually show that you are able to to apply your mind and apply yourself over and above the theory that that you're given. Mm. And I think that's what makes it difficult because um, of that whole process. And I understood when I got into it because by the time you get there, it's like now you are given all these assignments and it's not. You know, it's not enough for you to just go and read. Yeah. You know, it's not enough for you to go and read. And I think that's why the the selection process becomes so intense. Then the other thing also about the selection process was that there's a lot of, hence I said, I said it felt like you are applying for a job. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of interpersonal skills that they also test for. Yeah. Uh, they want to see if you are really passionate about about the, you know, about humans, about, you know, working with people. Um, you are being tested around things like your ethical principles. Um, you are tested on your level of empathy. So some of the questions that you are asked is if, if, if you had to work with an individual like this in the industry, how would you actually, um, you know, how would you approach that situation? So it's not just about the technical side of it where, um, you know the theory, but they tested your per, you as a person whether there was a fit um, with you know in terms of the the kind of industry that we we get into. Um, and now that I'm working in this industry, I, I can see why it was so intense for them to actually test it out. Sure, that sounds yeah. very interesting, and I can imagine yeah. it must be a lot of work. Um, so when you are done with your studies, uh, what mm-hmm. so. So I completed my, my master's um, coursework and then obviously there's a research element to it and um, completed the research, but then you wait for a while because there's back and forth marking and all of that. So in, after I finished in 2008, I went and, and sorry, 2007, I went and did my, my internship in 2008. So it's very similar to how, you know, CAs also, you have to go and do um, a work skills um you know, have to to do it for a period of time. So it's it's required that you actually go through that for twelve months. Sure, it's a structured process. Um, it's run by the Health Professions Council of South Africa, so they guide what content you need to actually go through when you get into your internship. So I had to do that. So I worked it at a company called Edcon um, for a period of twelve months, where I was under supervision. And, and I had the, the actual content that I needed to complete. Then immediately after that, then um, I got a permanent position within Edcon. So I got the job and I worked there for like six months um, until I moved to my next job. But it's very important for you to actually go through the 12 months program first. 
And then when I was done with my internship and it was signed off, we wrote, we write board exams, yep. so write a board exam. And in the board exam, they test things like ethics. Ethics is very, very big in my industry. You have to be an ethical person. You have to, um, there are certain values that you have to live by. If you're an industrial psychologist, then they test that out even in the, um, as part of the, the, um, the internship and, and board exam. So you have to get 75% on ethics. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to get another um, 70% for, for content um, that is more technical. Um, so there's a technical element and then there's the ethics uh, part that you need to pass. So I went and wrote my board exam and I qualified then to be an industrial psychologist. You must have been very happy and I can imagine your mom for all the effort of her paying with the help of the family. Yeah. Uh, been proud of you at that point. No, I, I think it, it it was a proud moment. I mean, I was the first person in my family to get a master's degree. That's that's a that's that's an achievement. So you know, you you look at it and you like you opening doors for for the guys that are coming up. Um, and I see now, you know, one of my cousins is actually studying towards psychology. Like she's doing clinical psychology, but it's those kind of things. Like if if it wasn't for me completing it. Um, and registering, like she wouldn't even know that there was this um, industry that was open to to people that looked like her. So, so it was a proud moment, honestly. I think for me, it's it was one of the motivations that got me to to work so hard in varsity because I knew the struggle of um, that my family had to go through in terms of, you know, having to pay for the fees and. I mean, vets is not cheap at all. Not at all. <laughs> it's not cheap, eh? it's not cheap. So you look at it and you're like, yeah, yeah what? <laughs> like, I can't afford to fail. Um, and yeah, so I think it was a proud moment, not, not just for my family, but for myself as well. Um, awesome. Good to see the results, yeah. Great. And then in terms of your, so so you've done an internship at Fcon. Mm. Uh, you've spoken a little bit about what was required for you to complete. But what yeah. was the purpose of the job? Like what? What, what were you doing in, in the company? Yeah, so so industrial psychology is quite broad, hey? Like it ranges from, um, you you do things around career development. So I did, I did a lot of that stuff when I was there, career development, learning and development. I got exposed to that. I got exposed, this is in my internship here. I got exposed to organizational development. I got exposed to labor relations, funny enough. I got exposed to talent management. Um, I got exposed to, you know, various forms of HR. So when you're doing your, your internship, the whole point is for them to give you exposure, you know, end-to-end -end type of human resources related elements. And then once you are done, you you can even determine like which, which aspect of HR you would like to get into. So, so it was quite a broad, it's very broad. And I think that's why from an internship, they wanted that structured because the industry is broad. Um, you find industrial psychologists that are um, doing more work around psychometric assessment. You find you know, psychologists that are doing more work around organizational development. You find others that are doing learning and development. So it's very broad. And I think the, the nice thing about our internship is that it exposes you to all of them. And it gives you that um, ability and, and also like, you know, now you, you are able to say, okay, well, this is what I enjoy um, and this is what I would like to pursue going forward. So I think for me, it was it was quite an intense program. I really enjoyed it. Um, you don't get into the depth of stuff, but I think it gives you enough though to make the decision as to where, um, which route you would like to take from, a, from an industry perspective. Great stuff. Yeah. So then you left Adcon, you finished your um, your internship, you got a permanent job, but you stayed for six months. <laughs> yes, I stayed for six months. Um, and so, I, think, I think the reason, you know, it goes back to the point that I was making now, that when you're doing your internship in industrial psychology, you, are, you get exposed to a lot of um, stuff. And Adcon at that particular time, they went through a restructure I was very interested in organizational development. There were no positions there. So, you know, you, you can't just, okay, not just because I'm, I'm interested in that and it's not available, then I quit. So 
you know, I, I was fortunate enough that my supervisor got me um, a position in the L&D space. And in that, like, that time, I was not really, like, L&D did not speak to me. Learning and development was something else. And I was like, mm -mm, not my thing. I was for six months, and I got um, poached by MultiChoice. Um, and then I got poached by MultiChoice. It's a very interesting story. Um, yeah, so they, they've always known about me because they wanted me to go and do my internship there, but I decided to go to EdCon. So they knew that I was I was available somehow. So I got poached uh, by MultiChoice and I went and worked as an assessment specialist for MultiChoice. Um, very good decision, best decision that I made because um, there was a lot of exposure that I got in that role. And um, yeah, so I got to experience quite a lot in my career when I was working at MultiChoice for three and a half years. So I left because I did not get the position that I wanted at, at Con. And when the opportunity um, came at MultiChoice, I was like, why not? You know, and then I, I went and, and worked there for three and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, assessment is one hurdle that people always go through in terms of getting a job and sometimes it's mm. in you and getting mm. a job. Um, yeah. can you talk about some of the challenges yeah. that that uh typically people or the misconception around assessments and how mm. people ill prepare for those assessments uh which becomes mm. a problem. so number one misperception about assessments is that it measures intelligence yeah not um so i think i wanted to just get that right out of the way because <laughs> I think the fact that you do have your degree, that says a lot. It says that from a cognitive ability, you do have you, you know, you do have that kind of intelligence. Assessments are basically, you know, I'm very passionate about assessments and I'm a great believer in assessments. Um, and other people are, it's it, it's a scary process for people to go through. And I yeah. understand, you know, I understand because I've also been on the other side. And for me, what I like about assessments, which are which is different from from interviews, is that you cannot fool an assessment, right? Like it's a very objective way of measuring people's abilities, people's um, uh, personalities, um, emotional intelligence, and so forth. So that's the great advantage of that of assessments. And what I always tell people is that the best way to actually get through an assessment is just tackle it for what it is. Like, just go through the assessment and not try and overthink it. Because the more you overthink it, the more anxiety um, you're inducing for yourself, and it's going to affect how how the results come up, right? And also, the the other advantage of assessment. So it's not just good for the organizations that um, are recruiting you, but it's good for you as well to know who you are as a person, to know what you are good at to know what some of the areas that you need to improve on are. Yeah. It's a great, great tool for self-assessment as well to go through it as an individual to say, you know what, I'd like to know what what is it that I'm good at because it's not just good that there's a job fit from an organization perspective, but for you as well. Mm -hmm. The reason why a lot of people get frustrated is that you are trying to fit into a size five when you're a size three. And then the shoe becomes too big and then you, you become frustrated. So assessments basically help you to say, the job is a size three job. Are you a size three? And there's nothing wrong with being a size four or a size five. You can be that. It means that then the job is not for you. And it helps. Not, it doesn't just help the organization, but it helps you as well because it reduces that frustration that you might have. So can you imagine if you're a size five, and then you're wearing a size three shoe. Can you imagine how tight that, that could be? Even with jobs, even with a job, like if you think of it that way, I'm moving into job A, but I'm not a good fit for this job. All it's going to do is induce frustration, induce anxiety, make me feel like I'm not good enough um, and so forth. So, so we shouldn't look at it as companies are just trying to exclude us from these processes um, or from me getting this job. But it should actually be viewed as they actually also helping me from on, on the other, other side so that I'm also not, um, I don't find myself in a job that's going to frustrate me at the end of the day. Yeah. So, for example, I'm like, imagine if I, 
like I've got such, I like working with people every day. I love talking. I love, you know, and then the next thing I get into a job because they're assessing um, my, my speaking ability, right? Yeah. And, um, okay, no, let me, let me use the, the different one. So let's say I'm, I, I feel frustrated talking and I don't want to talk and I just want to work on my own and I'm, I don't want to work with other people. And yes, this job that requires me to work with people, that requires me to continuously be um, talking and all of that. And then I'm like, I'm assessed on that. Um, I lie and then I say I like working with people. Then I end, I end up in that job. Then the next thing, I always hide in a meeting room and I don't, you know, get to speak to people. Imagine how that's going to look like, you know, not only going to frustrate the people that I work with, but it's also going to frustrate me because the thought of me having to speak in front of people would just freak me out because I don't enjoy that and I don't like that. Yeah. So students allow and give me at least input and, and help me self-reflect, which is quite important. Sure, that is very helpful. And thank you for that, because I think a lot of people always assume it's a mechanism to just reduce the amount of, or to shortlist people into a smaller yeah. group. It's actually a scientific process that helps mm -hmm. you as an individual, as well as the organization to see the fit. Um, mm -hmm. But also what, what, what I like is um, what you spoke about a little bit around potential as well. So they're not forced to say, oh, but you're not able to do this now. It's not done it in, in history. You have yeah. to be able to do it. Uh, yeah. So you can still develop it towards that space, which is quite cool. Definitely. Definitely. Now, you know, one advice that I would give people is when you go through an assessment process, a lot of the people don't know that you can actually request for your own feedback. So if it happens that the company does not give you feedback, do yourself a favor and request for that feedback. And when you look at the feedback, think about that example that I made about a shoe size. And it's not about you not being good enough for the job or not, but also the job not being good enough for you, if you view it that way, right? Yeah. It's important for you, as, as you were mentioning about potential, to say, I know that I struggle with A, B, C, and D, and how will I actually help myself close those, those gaps to be able to actually be ready for a job that is similar to what I'm applying for. Yeah. It's very important. You can request for your feedback. Um, you don't even have to pay for it. So so legally, because we are assessments are under the Health Professions Council. So legally everyone is is, you know, you can get your feedback if you want to. And if they say that you have to pay for it, then mm -mm, just yeah, you can take them to the Health Professions Council. You don't pay for it. We, we go back to the ethics that you're talking about. Amy. That's the ethics I spoke about, definitely. That's the ethics. So my colleagues are not supposed to actually request you to pay for, for your feedback. You are entitled to get your feedback. Yeah. But I'm assuming, I guess, maybe in context, um, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll print out a, a, a report for you. It could no. be a verbal conversation where they give you a, a summarized feedback of the activity. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So that's a very important uh uh, point that you are making because you have to be a qualified uh, practitioner to interpret some of these feedbacks, right? So yeah. you can't just we can't just email it to you. Definitely not. We can't just email it to you and say, um, here's the report, go read it for yourself. So it's very important for us to actually take you through the report and help you interpret the report so that you understand the content because it's it's quite dangerous. It's like a doctor, if you go to the doctor's um, rooms and then they give you a diagnostic and then they say, okay, here's your diagnostic and you don't even understand <laughs> the content is and you become very anxious. So it's go going back to the ethics that you spoke about as well. It's unethical for us to do that. So it's, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So now you did three and a half years um, work with Martin. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. So I... I got poached again at NetBank. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sound very, it's going to sound crazy, but I, I, I think we'll go back to this point, you know, like why do I keep on getting poached and all of that? Yeah. So I, I got poached by NetBank. Um, I was looking for a job. One of the me mentors that I had at Edcon was now working at NetBank. <laughs> I was speaking and I told her I was ready for my next move. Um, she just requested for my CV and then she, she referred me for um, an assessment manager role. Then the next thing I got called, inter got interviewed, 
all of that, the whole process recruitment got assessed. Um, and bam, got the, the job as an assessment manager. Never applied for it. Never, you know. Um, but I went through the process and I eventually got into NetBank as an assessment manager. I worked there for about a year and a half. And so as part of my career development discussions, I had indicated to my manager at that time that I wanted to get into talent management. Yeah. So a colleague of mine who was a talent specialist then left, went next door to the JSE, and there was a huge um, uh, project that NetBank was busy with, um, you know, and, and they needed someone to help with that big project. So because I had raised my hand up, before the opportunity was there, I said, when the opportunity um, arises, can I be, you know, can I, can I be considered? So there was a vacancy and my boss happened to actually look after two portfolios, the assessment and talent. And then she asked me, she was like, here's this great opportunity. It's a very big project. It's a bank-wide project. So are you interested? And I was like, never done this before, but well, Let's take it on. And then I, I took it on. I became the project manager for, um, at that time, they were implementing SAP. And um, to implement SAP, they needed to reduce the, the number of, of job profiles from 10,000 to 1,000. And I raised up my hand. I was like, I'm, I'm up for it. And then I just literally just moved, changed jobs from being an assessment manager into an assessment specialist. I went from being a manager of seven people to becoming a manager of no one, managing anyone. Um, and the, there's a reason why I'm making this example, because one person would see it as I'm actually going backwards in my career. But it all depends on what is it that you want ultimately. And my ultimate goal was I want to be in talent management because I love this talent management um, aspect of HR. So I want to get into talent management. And if it meant that for me to move from being an assessment manager into a talent specialist, I will, you know, not have people reporting to me anymore. I took that and I was like, I'm fine. Um, I looked at it in the bigger process and in a bigger aspect of where my career was, was going. And I opted for that. And then I missed out and I became a specialist from a manager to a specialist again. And as a specialist, I then um, then I became a specialist again, and then I looked after this whole process, and I looked after the project, and we landed the project and closed the project, and I was the project manager, and one, one of the biggest achievements in my career um, to have managed such a huge project, um, you know, for, for a huge organization like that. So that's where I ended up. And from there... As part of the project, I was given another, um, I was given two business units to look after. Uh, that was corporate and capital. And they happened to, to, to be merging at, at that time. And when they were merging, because I was the consultant for, for the two businesses, I, I had to, to help them in terms of the job profiles, which, is, which was related to that big project that I was doing. Yeah. So I helped them. Um, help them in terms of trying to consolidate the jobs, identifying duplications and all of that. And through that exercise, obviously, because I, I now worked with the two business unit um, HR executives and, you know, we had the you know project was also successful. When the business merged and they became CIB, um, they realized that they needed a, a, a talent, um, head of talent or senior talent manager. And the opportunity. <laughs> so I was asked, like, are you interested in coming? We don't see anyone else who can do this. You know, both businesses, they've, you know, the businesses one has never existed before. So you know that with corporate, you know capital. Now, because it's CIB, we need someone to help us with talent related stuff. So come through, let's have an interview, let's see if you are interested. And yeah, so I was asked and then I applied for that role um, and went through the process as well and ended up in CIB as a senior talent manager. So now I was I was having people that reported to me again. 
So, you know, so it was like a full circle. Um, worked in CIB space for how long? Three years. Another oh, two and a half years, two and a half years. So I worked in CIB for two and a half years and, you know, helped in terms of developing the um, grant program, which was now, you know, having to, to find its own niche as CIB because we always used to fall under the NetBank Group um, grant program, but now they needed their own niche one. So I was involved in the marketing aspect, um, got involved in, 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 in brand, you know, and very exciting, very exciting um, beginnings there. So it was quite a an interesting environment, tough environment, very tough environment. Long hours. Uh, yeah, <laughs> very tough environment. But uh, tough environments are good because the, the those are I call them. Um, I don't call them chal challenging anymore. I call them character building. Yeah. That's where your character is built as a person. Those kind of environments are needed to get you from a certain stage um, and grow you into a, to, into the next level. So, yeah. So I ended up there and stayed there for two and a half years. Worked with another C senior HR manager who was um, looking after a certain business unit because you know made I made an impression on her when she got a promotion and moved into rest of Africa then um, she needed someone to come and help with the talent stuff. And then I moved there for six months. Um, I worked there for six months and then got poached by a company that I work for now, which is Edge Growth. And I liked what they were doing, the space that they were operating in, which is like helping SMEs. So I thought, you know what? Maybe it's time for me to uh, move away from the big corporates into a small organization. Excuse me. So now I'm here and I am the head of people, which is take in technical terms is head of HR. So I look after HR end to end. So all the different bits and pieces of jobs that I used to do, now they've all come together into one. So I look after the entire HR value chain in my current job. Fantastic. And I want to take you back to your days where you're talking about the grad program. Um, yeah. it's, it's one thing I'm fascinated about um young talent and developing young talent um yeah something exactly. interesting is um i, I want to take you to a moment so i remember there was a, a time when uh i think we we're in the search for new grads um, yeah one of the things that was important was uh you brought on the table the issue of transformation yes um, and i think in the one year the report was so fantastic i think it was like a 70 percent shift uh, in recruitment of of young talent in a market where we thought, if you think corporate or CIB in, in, in yeah. our, um, you would think it's difficult to find talent in that space, especially African talent. Yeah. Um, yet you were able to achieve a seventy percent hit rate. Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. were some of the challenges um, that you saw in that space, and and why was transformation so important for you? So I think for me, CIB or investment banking in general has always been a niche um, environment where typically what you would find is mostly white males um, and you would not find, there, aren't, there weren't a lot of uh, black individuals that, that were in that space. And there's a whole lot of reasons why that was the case. I think one of the examples that I gave in terms of me ending up having to study industrial psychology um, was that, or, or not knowing about industrial psychology was that information was not available. Yeah. So in a lot of spaces, you know, like our African um, young talent, they don't know about these environments. They don't know about um, investment banking. And I actually found this out, especially when I was doing the, um, you know, when we're going to campus, the campus visits. Yeah. When people came, you'd find that a brilliant young individual studying to a CA degree, they don't know. They don't know that as a CA, you can actually become an investment banker. They don't know as a person who's studying economics, you can become an investment banker. As a person who even studies engineering, you can become an investment banker. So I think it's because of the knowledge and people not having access to understanding what the industries are. And, 
you know, and I, I think for me, what helped a lot was the campus visits. The campus visits, they played a very critical role because there you were there and you were accessible. So it wasn't just information being given out on a piece of paper, but it was information where people come and ask you. It was more interactive. Um, you could explain the different options within the CIB space that were available. And, you know, a lot of the, the, the young black talent were able to actually now start seeing themselves in those spaces. And the other thing that that we also that 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 I also like thought was quite useful was bring people that look like the people that you know like like them. So for people to to know that I can be able to become an itumelengo and refilwe. It's only when they see an itumelengo and refilwe. Yeah. Doing what they're doing. It shouldn't be on paper. So what we did was a lot of black talent, young people came and spoke to, to the grads um, on campus and they could see themselves. They could see, okay, no, there's, yes, this young chap, you know? Um, and and most of the time it's people that they even studied with. So they could say, oh, I, I remember you, you were my senior and now you are there. Um, so I think for me, the challenge is advertising, um, the branding of, 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 of the programs, the branding of, the industry as well as a whole, which could be seen in, in two aspects. It could be advertising and also the type of people that exist in those industries. Um, and if you get those right, then it's very easy then for people to actually have that kind of knowledge and say, well, I'm an engineer and I think I can actually work in this space. So the first challenge was that. The other challenge is because the, the industry is so niche to what they know, sometimes integrating different people was quite um, challenging. So as much as we did, it, we did the work and we needed to do the work externally with the grads, it was as important to do the work with the people in the business to get them ready for the people that are coming who are different from what they are used to. Yeah. So having to make sure that line managers are, are equipped and understand what, what is meant to be a manager of a grad, um, what is meant to be a manager of a grad, of a student that comes from rural Eastern Cape, rural Limpopo, rural um, KZN, looks like some of the things that makes those individuals different. It's very important. So having to do a whole induction, not just for the grads, but for the managers, and having them to even interact with some of the, the applicants, you know, in the process, because now they've got to actually be able to start engaging with some of these young talent. And they could see, now I'm meeting, there's a guy that could come from a St. John's, and then there's also a guy who could come from a Orlando High or yeah. wherever, you know? And how do I also, like, give the person who comes from Orlando High the same opportunity that I would give to a child that comes from a St. John's. So, so it's doing the work internally with the people and the managers that are there and also HR, HR personnel, just to make sure that they also understand what it's like to, to, to uh, recruit um, grads, but also do the work with the grads as well um, and get them to also start becoming, when they, when they start engaging, then they become a little bit more confident. You know, they become, the confidence gets built they can see that you're accessible. You're just a human being like, like they are. Um, and they're not just going to start knowing about you when they are coming for an interview. So, yeah. So those are the, the challenges. But, yeah, I've given the solutions as well to, to that. You have. You've actually tackled it very nicely. Yeah. And when we were talking, I was thinking of one scenario. Um, I think there was a grad you once told me about um, who was a straight A student. Young, yeah. Female. Uh, from a rural area, uh, mm. I think, if I still remember correctly. And in the interview, um, mm. it was just not confident, which is what you've been talking about. Yeah. And yeah. I remember you were saying that you actually stopped her, asked her to stand up, <laughs> think about her transcript and how well she's been doing. <laughs> yeah. To get up a little bit and then got her back into the room um, to sort of re represent herself with some yes. level of confidence. And um, she became one of the grads on, on the program. 
Mm, mm. Ended up even, I think she, you said she, she she was able to travel to Cape Town, uh, mm. to there for the first time, was on a plane for the first time in her life. Uh, yep. Independent from family for the first time in her life, mm. made a success of herself. So mm. thinking about the journey you're talking about in preparing the grads, preparing the line managers, and the mm. end, um, I think it was not just to make the, the path easy for the business, but it also yeah. made it easy for for the employee. Can you talk yeah. about that? Because there were many, many examples that you shared about yeah. those kind of things. I've got two in particular, um, ladies, and the they were from different years, actually. So one of them came into a, it was the, the final stages of the, the, the recruitment process and they needed to do a case study comes she was literally shaking um and then i told her listen go out um go outside for a while and i spoke to the business i said you can see that this person is not it's not that they are not able to to deliver yeah they're just nervous you know and let's allow her the opportunity to go in and relax you know outside she went outside I, I actually even went with her outside, spoke to her, tried to coach her to say, you know, you've done well, you are here because you deserve it, just come and do the best that you can. And she came in, she, like, she did so amazingly well, um, and she ended up on the program, so that was that year. And then the second one was, she came in for the, for the interview, it went very pear-shaped, she left, and that's a straight A1. Something in me just said, no man, like we can't just let this 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 lady go. Let her let you know, let me invite her. I actually literally called her back after the interview. She was going to go catch a taxi and I said, come back. I said, come back. We're going to start this from scratch. And she also did way, way better than than initially. And she ended up on the program, and that's the one that ended up going to Cape Town and She's doing amazing. I know she still works there um, at NetBank. And I think for me, it's it's about when you're doing this kind of work, you, you have to have that level of compassion and empathy, right? Um, and I think maybe for me personally, on a personal level, even outside the job, I, I just think about myself and where I come from. And I was once a you know, a very young black female who never got exposed to some of these things and someone gave me a chance. Yeah. It wasn't, handed, it, it wasn't given to me on a silver platter, obviously, but someone gave me a chance. Someone heard me. Someone um, gave me an opportunity to express myself. So in the job, you know, that I do with the grads and with the young people, I always think about that and say, if, the, if you're not giving this person a chance, who else will be giving that person a chance, you know? And it's about noticing the potential and knowing when not to also give up on that potential and giving that person a, an opportunity. Um, and I think that's, that's quite an important thing to have because you cannot afford, and that's where the ethics then also comes in because in the kind of job that we do, there's a... <laughs> It's not for everyone, hey? Like, to be honest, it's not for everyone. There are certain individuals that should not be doing the work that we do. Um, and if you lack those aspects of compassion and lack a level of empathy, um, it, it can make your job very difficult because you, you would never, you will struggle to actually put yourself in the next person's shoes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think for me, it's that's one of the passions that I have in terms of, Young and young people, because you you have to give. No one just rises without being given a, an opportunity. Yeah, it doesn't matter who you are. No one just comes and you just climb up and you become this big person where no one played any role. Someone has to play a role in your in your success in your journey. Um, and I I happen to one you know I wanted for myself to be part of people's journeys and it gives me great pleasure to see people do so well because it's not me necessarily it's reality yeah. they're very good at it they just needed someone to just open the doors for them but they definitely 
walked in and and worked um you know they were towards towards achieving what they're achieving yeah and i and i like that analogy it's that you 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 pathing the way for them um yeah. to excel at what they do it's it's got yeah. nothing to do with with you necessarily yeah. like created the opportunity they they saw it through and they made it a reality for them mm-hmm. as many examples i can think about just looking back yeah. at the program yeah there's one that i i found in the eastern cape hey? that one <laughs> <laughs> literally um it was one of the grand you know those those campus visits and in the morning i was going through the applications and something just said this one <laughs> but this one literally i i called him same day and i'm like are you available tomorrow for an interview because i'm here i'm in gramstown you were studying at Rhodes, and i'm like i'm in gramstown so are you are you available for an interview and he was like yeah sure i am go and interview this boy he tells me he's from soweto like how it's like sharing all the story and i'm like i had to come and fetch you from so far but you have to you know um and he's doing quite well last week funny enough he was telling me that he you and he wanted advice from me around salary like should he be requesting for like cuz now he's applied for a job and he's like yeah refire ref they they asking me for my salary um, slip and all of that and you know and it it like i'm no longer working in that in that environment but we still have that kind of relationship where he trusts me with with um certain decisions on his career and he was asking me for advice and you know and all of that and i think those are the things like you know you 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 impart certain things in people's lives that they will never ever forget and the and, and the same goes with them as well hey yeah. uh, so i think over the last two and a half years there i probably was involved in recruitment of about se- over 70 something grads bro um and there will be others that you will just not get rid of <laughs> always be in your life it will always be in your life and and i guess maybe that's how that's the nature of life right um you will have them i think i'm connected to 98% of them on linkedin they all want to connect with me sometimes they chat to me they will send me inboxes i see when they get promoted i see when they leave organizations i was like oh, okay you're doing well for yourself and um kudos to you and all of that so it's it it becomes like um I used to think of myself as a mother hen like all like, oh, my children I used to look at I'm like oh my kids my kids and even when they came into the business like the way that I used to defend them against business when the light manager does whatever I'm like no no not on my kids not not on my kids not, you know so so it became that kind of relationship but I think it also goes beyond that it becomes um you build you build relationships with people going forward because now all these grads they now they no longer grad they 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 are professionals in their own right um and that's network so it's also a networking thing um for myself and also for them to to keep in touch with me even beyond the grad program so yeah it's been great stories um i could yeah i i'm thinking of writing a book about my journey as a grad that could be such a useful book in that i'm pursuing that conversation to try <laughs> No that what I'm telling you like I I think a book about that it's it's because it's a journey it's a personal journey for 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 you as well as a person who does the work okay yeah. um sometimes we we take it for granted the the influence and the because I I mean I fought for this one from Grahamstown at some point he almost didn't get a contract and I was like okay. no okay. no and you become so attached to the grades as well it it's a it's a funny thing like it's you become so attached it's as if like their success is your like you, you know it's 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 imperative that they become successful because if they not becoming successful you take it up upon yourself as if like you're a parent you know it's it's a very weird relationship that you have with the grades but but i think for me it's not you know it's not just the stuff that they what i imparted in them but to me as well you know like there's a lot of experience and a lot of growth personally that i had to um go through when i was also recruiting because you learn a lot from them they challenge your perceptions about things they challenge your perceptions about life 
there was one yeah there's another one that i i had to when when we had the the fees must fall thing and he almost didn't make it to Joburg, and i literally had to take money out of my account to send to him to come to Joburg, um and try and organize for him to come and go through the process and you know it's those kind of things and they challenge you as an individual to say but you know on a normal day would you do something like that yeah. and what what motivates you from doing something like that as an individual yeah. so it, it was a dual thing i they learned from me but i also learned a lot from them and i learned a lot about myself through them as well yeah and yeah. i guess it's incumbent upon us as leaders to open that those doors because i mean it's not often that these these grads have the opportunity um and sometimes it's not their fault i mean like you made mm. an example now you had to help someone find to get to an interview um, yeah that's one of the things we have to help with yeah. so there's uh two things i want to wrap up the conversations with um one yeah. you are still studying <laughs> uh, i don't know what i'm thinking <laughs> your, PhD, yeah. your phd at the moment jeez how's that going um is it safe to say that it's not going anyway no. <laughs> i'm joking um so it's it's going very slow i think we you know with this whole challenge of working from home um, i'm finding that it's it's impacting me on how i you know how i'm completing my my studies at this point in time um and i think it's it's more around time management uh, which is something that i need to to really look into um in terms of focusing and and trying to get myself disciplined again um, so there's been positives and negatives about it. Um, my study required that I conduct interviews. Prior to lockdown, I started collecting my data last year, October. I struggled. I struggled, struggled to get time in people's calendars, to try and, you know, like I just struggled to, to get the data. Then now lockdown comes, everyone is stuck in their homes. Guess what? They were all available <laughs> and i got you know i collected all my data i think i i collected then my like all my 20 interviews by june end of june i was done um july was a bit of a tough month for me for personal reasons i i had lost my grandmother so there was you know like it was quite a, a tough month and i i just lost track um yeah. point so now we are in august and i'm trying to get back into the rhythm of doing things but I'm honestly finding it challenging in terms of trying to fit studies and work, um, especially because I don't say we work from home, I say we live at work. <laughs> <laughs> because our homes have become our work environment. So it becomes very difficult to try and separate that um, because the nature of working from home is that sometimes you lose track of the time. You will just carry on and on and on. Um, whereas when I was working in the office, I would say, I'm logging off now, disciplining myself at six o'clock. I'm done. I've put an extra one hour of work. I'm going home. Don't open my work laptop. I open my 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 uh, personal laptop and then I work on my studies. Now, there's blurred lines. Um, it's quite difficult. So I think, you know, now the challenge that I need to give myself is I just need to go back and recalibrate and say, what is it like how am i going to manage my time with the situation that i'm in and I, I guess that's where adaptability comes in you know you can't i can't use that as that as an excuse but fascinating stuff that i found in my research i really love my research and it gives me life and i um i'm enjoying it i enjoyed the interviews i enjoyed the people that i i got to interview so i'm doing my phd on transformation yeah. um, i know we've spoken a lot about the grads but I'm very passionate about transformation. I'm, I think I could, I delivered that transformation element in the grant because of my passion for that. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we need to addressing transformation elements, not just from a corporate perspective, but in South Africa as a whole, different aspects, that's where we're gonna get, we, we're gonna get a shift um, and get the country to, to operate in a different way. So we need to transform um not just transform from a racial perspective but transform in a whole lot of things you know like um class um accessibility of 
of stuff, um, of information to people. There's a lot that transformation has, which is not necessarily just related to what we know about transformation. And it's quite important for us to start thinking um, about that. And I'm getting, I got a very, very interesting feedback. I'm looking forward to, I can't wait to start actually getting deep into the um, the results and, and, and sharing it with, with everyone um, soonest, hopefully it's very soon. Uh, but I'm, I'm very like, for me, timelines are important. And if you prob if you say that you are you want to do certain things in a certain time, I think it's it's very imperative for me to just go back and just crack the whip on myself and get it done. But yeah, so, so uh, it's interesting. Yeah, no, good luck with that. I think I'm Thank looking you. forward to some of the results. Um, yeah. Transformation is a very important topic. Um, mm -hmm. I was reading a book by Nolita Fakute on body yes. sensing, and she talks a lot about we have to have that honest conversation as a country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, new opportunities, growth, if we want to see um, change in our organizations, mm -hmm. we have to have those honest conversations. And mm -hmm. yeah, looking forward to the results, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe just as a, as a closing point, I mean, you've spoken a lot about um, what you've done in the youth space, what you're doing, mm -hmm employees holistically, the work you're busy with now across mm. the in, in your new organization, and your love for people has come through your mm -hmm. organization. So if I'm watching you and I'm I'm like, I think I'm interested to go work in HR or uh, follow the route that Rufilo was looking at in terms of industrial psychology and explore different options, uh, mm. what do you say to the young person that is sitting listening to you today? Yeah, so I would... Definitely one of the things that I would say is passion for people is important. Hey? Like job is not for the faint-hearted. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity that um that we deal with as HR people. I mean, sometimes people's lives filter into work, and those are the things that you need to also be be able to hold space for. So if you're an impatient person, if you're a person who does not have tolerance for different types of people, this is not your, it's, it's going to be very difficult uh, for you to, to be in this space. Um, I think it's not a rocket science. It's not a rocket science job. There's a lot of technical ability that, that is required here in this space, which I think anyone can learn. Anyone can learn what we do um, from an HR perspective. But one thing that you can't, you cannot train this and it's 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 this. It comes from it. It's a job that you do from the heart, yeah. um, and you know not to just go on on the bandwagon of doing this because I think what I've seen with the with some of the the things that I've seen some of the colleagues that get involved that I've that I've been involved um, with and the the things that I've seen happen where people's careers get um, ruined. Um, HR is not vocal enough. HR is not holding business to account on certain things. And it's because we are having so many people that are, that are just getting into this job for the sake, for the sake of just being in the job. Um, and with this whole COVID situation and the whole, you know, post COVID-19, this is where it's going to be very critical to have proper human resources practitioners. Yeah. Um, and not just in corporate, but in general, like psychologists are going to be very important um, people to have. There's a lot of mental well-being that um, that we're dealing with that people are faced with. And for you to hold space for people that are having issues with mental well-being, it requires a lot of you. Yeah. Uh, it requires a lot of sacrifice. It requires you to park what your belief systems are and try and appreciate what other people's journeys are. So empathy is very important for this job. Compassion is very important for this job as well. Um, and also being brave and calling things out. Um, HR is not, it's not something that you, um, where you'll just have to go with the flow. You have to be brave enough to have tough conversations. Yeah. Um, you have to be brave enough to be able to give feedback so this is where now the, a level of confidence is required, uh, but also knowing your staff, 
because you you can only give courageous conversations when you know your stuff. So I I would really suggest that you know there's a lot of Google has a, has plenty of these assessments um, that you can do even if they're not really like um, scientifically proven. But I think they do have like at least the basis of what is required for 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 human resources type of jobs. And I would suggest that as a young person. Go through that and go look into um, into that space and see if it's something that that you could be interested in. Um, look through job specs and look at what some of the things that we do um, entail, um, and and make a decision then to say, okay, fine. Based on what I see, then you know it means that I I think that I can I can do this. Um, follow nice. You know, there's a lot of um, LinkedIn groups for industrial psychology, LinkedIn groups for HR, go on to those, you know, check them out and see what is it that they talk about? What are the topics that they're covering? Um, is it something that I think I would be interested in? And, you know, just gather that kind of knowledge and try and follow as many HR people as possible and look at what they do, um, you know, and, and I think that should give you the basis of whether you should be able to do that. But more than anything, like also just, you know, like sometimes you make a decision and you say, well, I wanted to do, remember my story about the two, the diverge, diverge, diversion I had to make in honors. So there's always, you can always like hop into this industry. Like you don't have to, to be straight from a trick. So I know some people probably they've done something different and they feel like they want to change in career. You can never stop learning as a person. So you could always get involved here. Uh, so yeah, so I think for me, passion, compassion, um, empathy, those are very important things. And you just need to be, to love like people and working with people and being around people because it can be, it can take a lot from you. And if you don't have those qualities, then um, I don't think that this industry is for you. Sure. Thank you so much for those words. Passion, compassion, and love for people. Yeah. Uh, we really, really appreciate your time, and thank you so much. And I, I know we can talk a lot about the things that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. actually try yeah. another conversation, but I think this is quite cool um, mm. in terms of having an understanding of what's happening in the HR space, your experience in it, and how industrial psychology has helped you through the journey. So, yeah. Thank you. So much for your time and thank all the you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> cool.